I've been doing a lot of projects about the ocean lately. And so I thought for this video, we'll do a demonstration of how to create a squiggly sea worm uh, with dynamic simulations and particles, as well as a ripply uh, ocean background and bubbles coming up. So we'll do the whole thing in Cinema 4D and Redshift, no plugins. The project files are available in the description if you want to follow along. Check out some other links while you're there and uh, let's get going. Here we are in Cinema 4D 2024. We're going to work on an animation uh, that has a tentacle coming up out of the sand and it's going to grab something and then get spooked. And so to do that, I'm going to start off with a landscape, as I often do. And I'm going to just make that landscape uh, kind of wide and a little deep. I'm actually going to curve this off in the distance a little bit. Let's make it kind of big because we're going to start off with a, we're going to have a cube for our character that'll be a lot smaller. We'll make them 50 by 50 by 50. So this will be our, our character, our tentacle character. Uh, so I'm just putting that in there right now for some scale. I'm going to hit N, B on my keyboard uh, just to give me my polygon so I can see how much detail I have, how much resolution I have. And let's go ahead and make this uh, a little bit denser and a little bit denser. And that should be plenty. I'm going to turn off borders at sea level, and then I'm going to just pick sort of a random... We'll put in the year. Put in a random sort of... I just want sort of a rough surface that looks like the ocean bottom. It doesn't have to be uh, tons of detail. It just needs to be something to hold uh, the info that we're going to be using. And I'm going to go ahead and move it back a little bit. And then I'm going to add a bend deformer. So bend, we're going to have it face, we're going to put it as a child of our landscape and have it face Z plus, and then say fit to parent. And I just do the fit to parent right now because that allows me to at least start with the shape that I like. And I'm going to have this slightly curved downward in the back, so it's sort of a drop-off, a subtle drop-off. But I don't want it to happen until it gets back here. And so even though I said fit to parent now, I'm going to actually uh, scale this. Oops. Wrong dimension. Scale this down in the Y a little. And move it back. And then I can bend it, rotate it down uh, 90 degrees. And that'll give us this nice drop off appearance. All right, so if I frame my shot, say something like right here, I can see what's going to happen with that landscape in the background. And so I'm just letting it kind of drop off out of our view. Now that I'm looking at this, I think I want to go ahead and make my landscape a little deeper. Uh, so let's see. And maybe a little wider as well. And I'm going to duplicate this bend and give myself a shorter version of that in the front. I'll just rotate it 90 to 180 degrees. And I'll pull it up towards the front. Just so we're getting this, this will help me with my camera uh, framing when I come in uh, in a little bit here. And I'll make that one a little bit less deep and uh, maybe increase the strength a little too. So the reason I did that is now I can come in with my camera and I have this sort of nice shape that I can work with. It's not going to cause me any sort of like obstacles in my framing. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and just increase the height of my landscape a little bit so it has a little bit more texture. And I think I am happy with that. So that's our landscape set up. Uh, that'll be our floor. And from here I want to go ahead and set up my uh, sand. So part of the scene that I want to make is to have this uh, sort of sandy bottom that is affected by our character which is the tentacle sort of worm character, have it affected uh, when the worm comes out of the ground and, and moves around. So you see the sand moving around. 
And to do that, I need to uh, create that sand and I'm going to use a cloner for that. So first thing, let's save this. I'm going to make sure we save our project and save it often. So we'll call this um, sand tentacle. So in order to make the sand, I'm going to start off with a sphere. And I'll make it a hexahedron. And I'm going to knock down the number of segments to be a lot less. And But I don't want a lot of resolution here because I'm going to distort these and I want them to look like kind of wonky sand particles. And so first I'm going to scale this down to make it really small. And I'll duplicate this. And what I'm going to do is make a few of these. So I'm going to hold down Control and drag, hold down Control, drag. Let's do like five, six, seven of these. I want some variety in my sand particles. Well, that however many, one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, eight of them, that's great. One of them I'm gonna make kind of a hero particle and I'll use that for something else. Uh, so here's what we're gonna do. I wanna distort these and modify them so they look a little more wonky, each one. So I'm gonna shift click these and hit Option G or Alt G to group them together. Sand particles. And then inside this group, I'm going to put a displacer. So Cinema 4D's deformers work two ways. They work either as a child of the object you want them to affect, or they work if you put them in a group along with other objects, they'll affect everything in that group. And so if I change my distortion to noise, you can see that each one of these particles is now being distorted so it looks like a little piece of rock. And for each one of those, I want them to be different. And how can I do that? Well, I can come into my displacer, and rather than having my noise space be in texture, I'm going to put it in world. And now, so that's basically creating this noise in the world, and depending on where these live in the space, they're going to be distorted differently by this um, deformer. So now I just play around with the amount for each one and like do I want it to be less or more. I just kind of want each sand particle to be a little bit wonky and I might come in here now and make each one of these an editable object. So I'm going to hit C. It's still being uh, uh, modified by the displacer but now I have the ability to come in sort of like change them. Make Maybe I want to make one deeper or longer. Maybe I want to make one really long and wide and sort of short and squat so you can play around with your shapes a little more so you get more variety uh, i think i'm pretty happy with that so now that i've got all these different sand particle shapes i can now use these as my uh, sand objects and so what i want to do now is select this entire sand particle group and right click and say current state to object. And that has duplicated this down here. It's gotten rid of the deformer and basically applied that deformation to each one of these shapes. And so now I can just delete my original. I've got all these as individuals. If I move them now, they're going to ret retain their deformations that I put in there. So perfect. I've got my sand particles all ready to go. Um, rather than label these Sphere one, two, three, four, five. I'm going to label these as sand. Okay, now that I've got all my sand particles sort of organized and arranged, uh, it's time to start thinking about how do I get all this sand on my landscape. And this is how we'll do that. We're going to use a cloner object. Um, I need to figure out before I do this sort of what my framing is going to be like. Uh, so I have to think about where do I want this worm to come out and what, I want, what do I want it to do. It's going to be basically happening in this region right here. But I know I'm going to use this shape as my worm eventually. So what I can do to start with is just take this guy, uh, rotate him 90 degrees, place it here. 
And then I'll go ahead and set up my camera. Uh, and I'll get at least an initial framing shot here that allows me to have the entire creature after it's sort of stretched out along its space in focus. All right, so this is going to be my framed shot to start with. And this will give me a good guide so that I know at least how much of the space I need to fill in with the sand particles. Because when I select my camera, I can see that actual frame. So that's just a useful way to help figure out, you know, where you need something to be. That also tells me I can probably take this landscape and shrink it down a little bit. And move it all over. And also think about like what kind of ground do I want it to occupy when it's moving around. So cool. And so what I want to do is build a frame around here that fills up all this area around my object with around my creature with the sand particles. And I'm going to do that with some walls. And so I'll just make a, a cube. Extend it out and make it taller. And so let's say this is going to be one edge. Copy that, paste it. And I've got this extending through the bottom of my landscape, and, and that's okay. It's actually perfect. So I'm just copying this, and pasting it, rotating it. And I'll move it to the back here. And I want this to actually come behind this drop off just tight, slightly because I'm going to fill up the space back here. I, I want uh, the sand particles to fill in all the way back to the drop off area uh, so that when it bends down in my frame, I don't see anything else behind it, just those particles. And so I just need to make this guy a little longer. And I'll duplicate that one. I don't need so much in front of the camera, so I can probably be happy with that right there. And we'll make both of these a little longer as well. So they overlap each other. And so I've basically made this contained area uh, where my sand particles can live. Uh, and then I'll make these invisible when I am rendering and working later on. So from here, let's go ahead and create a cloner object. And in that cloner, I'm going to place all of my sand particles that I created earlier. And I can get rid of this sand particles container. And so cloner right now is creating all the sand particles that I made, and it's doing it iteratively. So if I select my cloner, you can see that it's on grid and it's saying iterate. I'm going to change that to random, so it's just randomly generating and selecting which one goes where. And that random component is decided by the seed number here, so you can always come in here and change the seed if you don't like the way things are being generated. So I'm just going to center up this cloner a little bit and just think about how many I'm going to need. So let's put them right above my object. And we need a bunch, right? So they can be close together. We don't want them overlapping, but they can be close together. And we'll do that in both directions. Oops. So kind of close together, almost touching, but not actually touching. And I'm going to do the same thing vertically. So we'll start off with just a 9x9, nine nine, or 3x3, three three, sorry, grid. That's great. Three by three grid. And from here, I want to uh, actually increase that to like five by five. I'm using per step, so I figured out the steps first. And now I can just increase the numbers so it fills in my box. And essentially, I'm just going to make 
enough of these so that it's filling in this entire box. Well, depending on your system you're working on, this will be more or less speedy for you. I'm just trying to get them kind of close together. And then I'm going to add a random effector. So I'm selecting my cloner. And I do that because when you select your cloner and add an effector, a MoGraph effector, it actually applies it to the cloner. Otherwise, you have to come into the effectors tab and drop them in here. But if you select your cloner, go to MoGraph effector random. It's going to randomize them for me. Uh, and then I can change the parameters. I don't need it to be so crazy. Let's say five by five by five. Let's say rotation in all directions. 360 by 360. Let's do scale, but let's do scale. Um, I was gonna say do it uniformly, but I'm not going to. I'm gonna do it slightly ununiformly so that we get more variety actually in our sand. Articles. So now each one is really kind of unique. Um, now in my cloner, I want to look at the object, and right now it's an instance mode. I'm going to change it to multi instance, and that will just allow it to happen a little bit more quickly. Uh, so that'll help, hopefully. Uh, from here, I need to set up a few things. So next step in our process is going to be letting this sand, these sand particles sort of fall down. I'm looking at my scale of my sand, and I want to make it a little bit more dramatic. So I say 0 0.3, 0 0.3, 0.3. Okay, I'm pretty happy with that amount of variety. All right, so let's set up our dynamic system so that we can get these um, falling where we want them. So the process here is going to be set up our dynamics, let the sand particles fall down, and then we're going to uh, sort of save them in that spot. So we're going to say tell them to, to stay where they are after they've fallen, and then we'll use that as our starting point to do the rest of the animation. So first step is on all of the objects that it's going to be interacting with, we want to have a collider object. So that is our cloner and all of these cubes. And while I'm at it, I'm going to select all these cubes, and I'm going to Option G or Alt G, and I'm going to call this uh, Walls. And so in all these walls, and as well as the cloner, so I control click that, I'm going to say tags, bullet tags, collider body. And in the collider body tag down at the bottom, uh, I'm going to turn bounce down a little bit, maybe like 20. I do, well, uh, I do want the friction to stay out pretty high. And then in my, um, I'm sorry, I did that incorrectly. I wanted this not on my cloner, but on my landscape object. So my landscape object and my cubes all have a collider body. My cloner is going to have a bullet tag rigid body. And in those, I want to have less bounce, maybe 1% bounce, and we'll leave the friction and all that where it is. Um, and just for fun, let's see what happens just playing this. Let me save it first. So that exploding part, that's because some of them were overlapping. And what I think I'm going to do to fix that is just scale these down. So I'm noticing that they're a little bit huge, I think, still for my, for my needs. So I'm going to come into my transform and under scale, I'm just going to change these down to point. 7, 0.7, 0 0.7, and that's going to make them all a lot smaller. And so hopefully we should have less of that sort of exploding thing happening. And let's see how that does us.
So that looks pretty good. Um, I think I'm getting a nice coverage on my ground here. I feel like I could be a little better. So I'm going to keep working on it. Let's turn off our character cube here just for a little while. And let's go ahead and tell our walls to be unrenderable. So if you just hide both of them uh, with the little buttons here, that's the same thing as coming into your viewport visibility and turning this off. All right, so each time you click that button, it's changing. So with the viewport visibility off, I'm going to look through my camera angle and see what I need to do. All right, so I can see right now I need to make these a little bit smaller. And I need to push them all a little forward, right? I've got them too far back. So, okay, that's great. I messed up my camera angle, but that's okay. I'll fix that in a little bit. I still have basically the size. Uh, so I think what I want to do is take the cloner and the walls, and I'm just going to pull this whole thing back a little closer and play and see what happens. Once you get to a point where they've kind of settled and they stop moving for the most part, then we can again look through that camera. All right, now I'm actually in my camera scene. Uh, it's looking pretty good. I think uh, I think I'm pretty happy with that. One thing I do want to do uh, is add a little bit more variety, I think, to my sand. And so to do that, I'm going to come back into these and just scale some of them down. So they have a little bit more variety in there. I think I'll also increase the amount of movement here in this random effector. Great, save. I just wanted some of those smaller particles to be able to come in and fill in the sand. Okay, so I'm just going to play this forward for about 90 frames and let it settle. Maybe 150 frames. Just going to increase my frame here. And I'm going to let these come out and settle. What I'm doing right now is just trying to set up the initial sort of uh, field here. Okay, they've settled for the most part. And so what I can do now is come into the um, cloner settings. And in the cloner dynamics body, I can come into dynamics. And there's a button here that says set initial state. And so after you've run a dynamics, uh, you can say set initial state. And then now when I go back to the beginning, it actually holds that information and saves it in the file, which is great because all of the stuff now is calculated. I can save it uh, and it's just going to hold it in there for me. So I can start with a brand new uh, dynamic simulation working with my character, and that's what I want to do. So we're going to call this guy Worm. He's going to officially be a worm now. And I rotated him around. I'm going to undo that. I'm going to have it zero. And so this is the part where we're going to go ahead and create our character and let it get set up. Uh, I'm going to come into my Dynamics tab for my cloner here, and I'm going to say Uncheck Enabled. And that's just going to allow it to not be trying to calculate anything while I set up my animation. All right, so that's a really important step. So we've set up our dynamics. We've let the sand fall on the ground. And it's sort of set up for its initial shot. And then I've disabled, I set the initial state. And then we've disabled the dynamics. So now we can work without having to process the dynamics all the time. Uh, and so from here, I'm going to set up my character, animate the character. And then we'll do the dynamics run again from that point. Now this animation is going to be a 
15 second animation, but I'm going to give myself a little padding at the front. So instead of 450 uh, frames, I'm going to do 550 frames. Um, and then I'm imagining this first 100 frame frames as just padding um, to uh, get our particles and things like that working the way we want them to. So I'm going to start my animation components at frame 100. Let's set up our worm. Um, to do that, I'm going to go ahead and hide a lot of this other stuff. So we've got our cloner, our random, our cloner, our walls. Um, I'm going to put these all in a in a group. I'm going to call this environment and hide it. So now all we have is our landscape and our character, which is just a cube right now. Uh, I want this to be a worm that bends and moves around really easily. Uh, and I, I don't want to do a whole bunch of character rigging and bones or joints or anything like that. First of all, I'm not very good at that. And second of all, I think this is an easier and more effective way to do it. So here we go. Uh, let's turn off our landscape, just uncheck it. And let's go ahead and hide these things from the view. And so now we're back with just our, our worm character. So what I want to do with this while I've got my lines, uh, polygon lines viewing, is in the objects panel, I just want to add some Y segments. And I'm going to add 20. So I want it to be pretty bendable. And then I'm going to add, the next thing I'm going to add is a taper. So I'm just dragging this down to the bottom so I can work on it uh, here. I'm going to add a taper so it's uh, sort of pointy um, at the top. So we'll find our taper. We'll make that a child of our worm. And I will say fit to parent. And then we just want to increase the strength. And that will give us our pointy shape of our tentacle. Uh, let's put this worm in a subdivision surface. So I'm going to hold down Control and, sorry, I'm going to hold down Alt <laughs> and put him in a subdivision surface and see how I feel about this overall shape. I think he's a little too pointy at the top, so I'm going to reduce this taper a little. And then there's a curvature component to this. So you can decide if you want them to get a little fatter in the middle or what. Up to you. So that'll be my overall worm shape. And to get this to bend and move around, uh, I'm going to use bend mod uh, deformers. So I'm going to create a bend deformer. I'll make it a child of my worm. I'm going to put it after the taper. Uh, Cinema 4D processes things from top to bottom. So I want it to first taper and then start to bend things. Um, this bend is going to say fit to parent. And so right now it's it'll do this, right? So we can, we can make a wiggly worm. I want to say keep length. All right, so useful, but not going to give us what we need. Instead, uh, what I want to do is make a whole bunch of these. And I'm going to make each one of them 100 centimeters tall. All right, so this one is going to be the first one, 100 centimeters tall at the base. And then I'm going to control drag one down and move it up, right? And I'm just going to visually kind of align these with each other. So this will be the second one, the third one. So I'm holding on control and just dragging those down, moving them up, moving them up. And one more. Close enough. And the reason I did it like that is now I have a lot of additional control, right? And I can take this bend and bend just that part. And then I can take this bend and just bend this part. Now you can see it's getting wonky. And so I'm going to have to think about how to, what is the order of these and how are they going to function? And I think I might need to process these in the other direction. So bend three from the top and one down. So let's start with bend four at the top and bend. So we'll bend it a little bit. And then we can bend this one a little bit. And then we can bend this one a little bit. 
So this is working much better, right? So that order does indeed matter. And we're going to start to get weird things as we go far down a lot, right? So we have to be careful about that. Um, just realize this can be a problem. So there's a bit a limitation to how much you can actually do. But we do have a lot of control. From here, uh, I just want to start setting up my animation and figure out exactly what I want this character to do over time and how much I can do with it. I know that I want it to sort of come out of the ground and then start moving around. Um, but what I want to do is actually have it come out of the ground and automatically go into a shape that I've predetermined. And a way we can do that is instead of having all these bend modifiers as children, let me go ahead and reset all these back to zero. And what I want to do now, instead of having these bend modifiers or deformers as a child of the worm cube, is I want to create uh, another group. So option or alt G, and I'll say worm holder. You can call it whatever you want. And then I'm going to take all of the bend deformers and I'm going to put them above the cube, right? I'm going to keep the taper as part of the worm. Um, but all of the other ones are going to be out here separately. So they're still going to function in exactly the same way. Uh, but what's going to happen now is I can do something like this. Let's just do some quick, quick bending. Okay, so let's say that's our initial state. What, what I can do with this now is I can an actually animate my worm inside this group and it's going to slide into that position, right? So I can just like push it up and it's going to slide into that position, which is cool. The other way I had it set up when these were a child of the worm, if I did that, it's actually going to not function the same way, right? If I move the worm, it's just going to go with it. So by having these up here outside of the worm, I have a little bit of a different kind of control, which I think is going to be really very useful for this animation. Oops. Okay, so we've got our worm set up and rigged. We've got our sand particles down on the ground. We've got our um, landscape all set up. And from here, we are ready to begin our animating. I'm going to go ahead and turn all of our environment objects back on so that we can see what's in our environment. And I want to, I want to set up some just initial actions for our character. So to begin with, re recall we're going to start at frame 100 for our actual animation. And I'll go ahead and put this at 100 now. So. We're starting here, it's easier to look at that way. We want to just have a few frames of nothing, right? And then we're going to have our worm come out and start looking around, looking, uh, moving around. And then he's going to, oh, find this little spot that he wants to curl and grab onto. And then something's going to come up and block the light. A shadow is going to come over him, which will spook him, and he's going to suck back down into his hole. And that's the end. Okay, so... That gives me sort of an idea for where I want to start uh, keyframing. And so I'll start at 120 with our character down below. And actually, I'm going to go ahead and turn off the this for just a moment. I want to figure out where I want my character to be at the end. So actually, I think we need to move this entire thing up. So we want to have it at its fullest extent right here. And maybe move them around a little bit. So I want to make sure my initial setup is perfect before I do this. Okay. So we've got our character where he needs to be. And so we want, to, want him to start off down below the sand, right? So I'm just going to move it down below the sand. And go ahead and keyframe our character. And then how long do we want it to take for him to come out? Sometimes I like to just hit the playhead. I think about there for him to be all the way out and we can adjust that so i just want to keyframe him up to the about this spot and we'll go ahead and 
keyframe that and then play that and see how it feels. I think it needs to take a little bit more time. I'm just popping up my dope sheet. Um, let's move this around here. I think it needs to take a little more time, so I'm just going to grab this last frame and pull it out a little more. Yeah, maybe a little more. Now, re remember, when you're playing in your uh, scene here, you're not getting exactly real-time playback, but it's pretty close, um, depending on how much you've got going on. So we're going to do a preview eventually so we can see if our timing looks really nice. So he's going to come out here, wiggle around for a little while, and eventually he's going to get spooked and he's going to jump back down into his little hole. And that's going to be a very fast motion. And so I can actually just copy these keyframes, right? I can grab this one, control, drag it to here, maybe here. And then I could take this first one and control drag it. So this will be a very quick motion, right? It's going to suck back into his hole. And so we've got our base animation there. Now from here, we can start setting up like, well, what kind of initial state do we want him to be in when he comes out here? So I'm going to come to my first frame here, and I'm going to use my first, my bottom um, bend deformer, and I'm going to bend it back like this, right? So I want him to first come out uh, and be in this shape, right? So now my worm's going to come out of the hole and be bending in this direction. And from here, uh, let's do some additional bending. So we'll take this second one, bend him down just a little bit. And at this point, I might actually want to go ahead and have my sand visible. We've lost our initial state, and I don't know why that is the case. Okay, so it's that's happened. <laughs> okay, that's weird. That's happened because of the way I sort of cut this off. So I lost my initial state, but uh, if I put back my zero frame in my timeline, it seems to have fixed the problem. So I just wanted to be able to uh, see what's going on. So I think. Let's set up our initial frame here with our camera. So we want to have our, and I'm going to keyframe my camera so I can stop moving it. So we'll have our initial frame be something like this. And then I will keyframe this camera. And stop looking through it. So now when I move around, I'm not going to be messing up my camera anymore. And we can continue setting up that initial state of our character, right? So we've got two bends happening. Uh, let's see. Let's have them. Move around a little. So remember, this is just like the state he's in when he first comes out of, of the hole, right? So this is just, he's going to be coming into that shape, and then we're going to be immediately moving him around. And so really, it's just like playing with the movement and seeing what kind of uh, motions you'd like your worm to do. And just remembering that you're moving from the bottom up here. So... After I've set up this, these initial states, I want to come in here and I want to go ahead and keyframe my strength and angle for each one of these. Uh, so that's going to hold that initial um, motion. And then from here, I want to turn on automatic keyframes for things that are animated. So record animated is the second one down, and then we'll turn on automatic keyframe keyframing. And that way, I can come out here a little bit later on in my timeline and just start moving things. And it's automatically going to change based on uh, what I've done before, right? What I've keyframed before. 
So now I can move this one, pull them out there a little bit. I just want them to sort of be, you know, searching around. I just want to check on my dope sheet down here to see if we've what we've keyframed and what we have. And so I can see that bend four, three, and two have been animated. Bend one hasn't had anything done to it yet since the initial state, and bend the first bend here hasn't had anything done to it either, which is okay. Um, but maybe I want to uh, do a little bit, just some subtle things, just so that my keyframes are kind of even and all of them are moving a little bit each time. I think it'll make it a little uh, easier for me to have more dynamic motion. Now, this is interesting, like I'm at zero, but you can actually drag left if you drag in the box here and go negative zero. So now we've got this entire motion happening, right? So this whole thing's wiggling over that direction. Each one of the bend modifiers or deformers has had something keyframed. So I'm just coming out a little bit later, making some additional changes. From here, I think I want to straighten back out a little bit. It's like he's searching for around, around for a, an object or something like that. And then I'm going to have it coil around a spot right here. And before we do our continued animation, I'm going to put a special little uh, doodad sort of thing right here so that he's actually sort of coiling around something to grab onto it, as if that were the, was the thing that it was searching for. I was getting a little distortion in there that was kind of annoying me. Okay, I'm loving that. I'm loving that he's like up there like that. Now I want him to straighten up and sort of like grab onto a bunch of stuff right here in front of him. I'm realizing I'm getting close to my end section here, so I'm going to have to be thinking about that and how do I want to deal with that. Um, I might need to move these keyframes closer together which I'll do in a moment. But from here, let's go ahead and try to straighten it all back out. So I want it to be kind of almost back to zero for everything. In fact, I think I'm just gonna put them all on zero. And then modify from there. So I'm just clicking on each one here, making sure that everything's keyframed. So I've got a problem. He's dipping down below the ground right now to get back to zero. So I'm going to have to figure out a way in between here to fix that. And it might just be as simple as something like that. Just adding a little angle adjustments in there. And he's still dipping down. I kind of dig that actually because he's getting like he's going to move those around. And I think from here I'm going to grab all of these and then just just the uh, bend animated components. I'm just going to move them down in my timeline a, a notch. And what that's going to do is it's going to make it so that 
these are coming out and he's moving right away, which I kind of like already, right? So now the um, animation is happening as, as soon as he comes out of that. And then from here, I want him to sort of curl up and grab onto some things right here. So let's see. So I think when I get to this uh, curl here, I, I want to keep these angles about the same, right? So maybe I need to, at this stage, pull the angles back a little bit more. Make sure I'm on the frame. So I think with any animation like this, especially where you're using these kinds of bend things, it's just kind of you know, it's a little playing around to try to figure out uh, what what's going to work for you. So what I'm doing is I want to extend this last section. So I'll have him wiggle around like that. I'll make some more adjustments back there. Um, come down. I want him to sort of come down a little bit before he gets to here. So I want this. I want there to be a section in here where he's a little closer to the ground already before he starts to curl. Yeah, like that. So I'll just extend these out a little further. And I'm going to position these a little bit more in the middle there. And then we'll work on this curl and make it even a little bit more curly. So I just want to pull this in a little bit more. So he's like really hugging those things close to him. Let's see how that feels. Okay, so we've got our animation pretty good. I think there's that one spot there I want to address. So he's not digging into the ground right here. And so I need to figure that out. I might just add a... Slight change here. There we go. So there's nothing wrong with going in between your frame areas. And I'm going to just pull these a little bit tighter. So there's a little pause in there uh, before he goes away. So he's like, grab this thing, he's settled, and then scared by a shadow. And then I'm going to pull this one actually a little closer as well so it's not... So it's a little faster. Awesome. So just one more time, here's our animation uh, at frame 120. Our, our um, tentacles come out and it does its little wormy dance, grabs some stuff, scoops it up, and then sucks back into his hole. Perfect. So now that we've got our animation all set up, it's time to set up our dynamics simulation for the worm coming out and interacting with the sand particles. Um, actually, there is one thing I want to do before I do that. I want to add in my little special particle 
that's going to drop down and be part of this thing that's scooped up. And so for me to do that, I need to create it first. And I think what I'm going to do is just make a platonic object. And it's going to be about the same size as the sand. So this is a icosahedron, which is cool. I just want to make like a little gem sort of a thing that happens to be sitting in here that'll have a different color. And hopefully it'll get scooped up along with everything else if it lives right there. And so I'll tell that platonic object to also have the same dynamics tag on it. And that'll fall down at the very beginning now when I start my uh, dynamics calculation. And we'll just uh, put a different material on that. And I just want to make sure that it's visible in my render. And actually, I might make a, a few of them. And Just arrange them so there'll be this little collection of sort of rubies or whatever sitting there. Um, we'll group this, we'll call it gems. So I want to cache this so that we don't have to wait for it every single time, but I think there's a couple things I need to do first. Um, I'm going to go ahead and play through this a little bit and let these gems fall down so that they're right on top. Um, and after I do that, I need to set the initial state of those objects so that they'll hang out. Um, otherwise, we're going to run into some simulation problems down the road. And so after I'm pretty happy with where those are sitting, I'm going to go ahead and come in here and on each one of these, I'm going to right click and say dynamics set initial state. And then I'll go back. And then now these will be in, in there and they'll be included as part of our dynamics calculation. So I'm going to save this and then come into my cloner and say cache. I'm going to say bake all. And that'll bake even the other dynamics tag up here. It'll bake everything in there so that if you're not familiar with baking, baking is just basically recording all of the information so that you don't have to play through things slowly. It'll record it all so that you can scrub through your playhead um, more dynamically uh, as we set up our render. So I'm going to say bake all. And I'm going to let this go ahead and calculate, but I'll speed this up for you so you don't have to watch the entire thing. Okay, now that the calculation has finished, let's see what we've got. So I'm just going to go ahead and hit play. So those gems are settling in nicely. And now we've got our character coming out. Look at the motion of the sand is looking really nice. And nice interaction with the sand particles. He's scooping up some of those gems and then gets spooked and goes away. I love the way the sand is flying away. Uh, there's actually something I want to do to change some of the interactions here. I would like some of the particle simulation to be a little slower. Because right now it feels like we're not underwater. It feels like we're out of water. So I'm going to go back to the beginning here. And I'm going to do some changes to our um, simulation settings. So I'm going to come under bullet, under, so I hit control D or edit project settings, and I'm going to come into bullet general, and I'm going to change gravity down to more like maybe 400. I don't know, there's not more, less gravity underwater, obviously, but there is more friction, which kind of behaves in a similar way. And I'll just go ahead and increase the density of things as well. 
So two for the density and air density, I'll say four. And then I'm going to come back to the first frame. So I need to say clear all caches. And then I need to say bake all again. And now it's going to rebake that simulation with the settings uh, that I just changed. And so I'll speed this up again for you. All right, so our calculation for our dynamics cache has finished for the second time. And let's see how this is looking with the changed settings. So I think I'm liking this a lot better, right? So things are not flying everywhere. It's a little bit more subtle feels a little bit more like it's underwater. Yeah. Okay. I'm liking this quite a bit. Yeah, there's a lot more fun motion happening. I think this is going to work really well. So I'm going to say save project incremental just so that we have all this information saved for our project. Now that we've got our dynamics calculation set up nicely, we can go ahead and uh, frame our camera and get all that in, get all that ready to go. So I'm just reframing my camera based on the motion that I see here. I want to get the sand layer in that bottom thirds kind of part. So it's coming out here. He's doing his little. And he's going to scoop this up. I think just slightly pull down. Great. Happy with that. Uh, my camera is selected. I'm keyframing. My camera and all is good. So one of the things I want to set up now is uh, some bubbles and as well as some uh, water overhead, right? So in order to have this like nice watery surface over above our heads, we're going to have to create something to do that. I also want to create a, a particle simulation of bubbles coming out. So I'm going to stop looking through the camera and I'm going to set up the particle simulation of bubbles first. Um, let's make sure we've got some things organized here. We've got our environment, landscape. This is our worm. So I, I like to have things sort of uh, minimized as much as possible. Let me make uh, a new particle emitter. So we're going to make a particle emitter. It's going to be emitting particles vertically. So I'm going to rotate it so that the Z is pointing straight up, right? So if I do that and hit play, the particles are shooting straight up in the air. Okay. And I want to make this uh, bubble field be about that needs to take up at least as much room as our framing and be a little deeper than that. It doesn't need to get too close to the camera, so I'm going to keep it kind of only in that shallow depth of field focus range that we're going to be in. So I'll have it kind of overlapping our character a little, maybe make it a little wider than that. So I don't want big bubbles coming really close to the camera. That'll be distracting. And what I'm going to do is just create some spheres and I'll give them a few uh, subdivisions and I will make them hexahedrons and I'll make them tiny. All right, so I want to have as many spheres. I probably don't need that many subdivisions. We'll put it back on 32. So I just want to you know, kind of get a feel for what size I'd like these bubbles to be. So maybe I want to look back through my camera and I'm just going to scale. So here's a bubble, I'll copy and paste that one and T for scale. Maybe I'll make some smaller ones, something more in the middle here. I think four, four bubbles is probably plenty. So uh, we'll call this bubble one. It would have been easier if I named the first one bubble one before I copied it. But that wasn't so bad. 
we're going to put all of these bubbles inside our emitter. And then we're going to tell our emitter to, under the particle section, to show objects. And then now if I hit play, we're going to see those bubbles shooting up, right? That's great. And then I want to, and it's happening, you know, well before our 100 frame point gets here. So that's also great. Let's add some more ver variety in there. Let's add some more bubbles and we'll make them go a little slower. So I'll say 10. We want them to last our entire animation. So that's 550 is when it stops. Um, lifetime, 600 frames should be good. And let's go ahead and say end scale zero. We're not gonna see them end. They're gonna be up above our frame, but just in case I want them to disappear, not pop. So that feels like a good amount. Uh, we want them to move a lot slower, so I'm going to cut this down to like 50. And then I want to, I'm going to make it 60 actually, and I'm going to put variation of 20%, so they're not all coming up at exactly the same speed. There'll be some variation. I feel like that might be too many bubbles. I might go back to 10. And let's add in a little bit of turbulence so that they're not just going straight up in the air. So we'll say simulate forces, turbulence, and we'll crank up the force on those that turbulence a little bit so they're a little bit more erratic, kind of flying around. And maybe we'll increase this scale Maybe we increase the scale too much. Let's just do two. Cool. I still feel like there are too many, so I'm gonna knock this down to like seven. And then we wanna take the entire emitter and just place it down below, right below our landscape, right? So these are coming up out of the ground. We don't see the emitter, we don't see the bubbles emerging so much. I see some of them still flying around a little bit that I'm not happy about. And so I'm going to add one more thing. I'm going to add gravity. And then in, in the gravity setting, I'm going to say minus 200. It comes in 90, 981 positive. So I'm going to do minus 200 and that's going to pull them vertically a little bit more. And they'll say minus 100. I want it to have a little bit of the wiggle, but I want them to go straight up in the air. Yeah. Much happier with that bubble action. Save my file. And the next thing I'm going to make is uh, a cube that sits overhead. And this is going to be our watery surface, right? Because I want to have the water kind of up in the background and I want it to be ripply and looking nice. And so here we go. We're going to make a cube. It's going to be huge and huge. I'm going to stop looking through my camera. And it doesn't need to be very thick. It needs to actually be very thin. So thin, tiny cube. And then I want to tell that cube to have a lot of subdivisions. So we're going to do until it feels nice in the X and Z. Kind of cubish square. They don't have to be perfectly square, but happy with that. At this point, I'm going to turn off my um, line view. So I'm going to say display. I'll just click the first one. Uh, I want to. This will help our um, preview happen a little bit faster. Let's go ahead and move this up in the air and let's go ahead and move it back. All right, so it just needs to be, it needs to be above our animation, but it doesn't need to be too huge. And let's look through our camera and see how that's feeling. Okay, it needs to be a lot bigger.
That needs to be a lot wider. Move it back even more. I think that's probably pretty good. I think I'll pull it down a little. And then from here, I want to add in a deformer, and I'm going to put in a displacer. So I'll put a displacer as a child of my cube. We'll call this cube water surface. In the displacer channel, I'm going to put in a shading noise. The type of noise I'm going to use is going to be wavy turbulence, or let me see. No, displaced turbulence. Displaced turbulence feels very watery. It's beautiful. Um, we want to increase the scale. And I might turn my lines uh, distortion back on for a little bit just so I can see this scale change. And then I want to, under the object setting in our displacer, just increase that amount a little bit. So yeah, I'm going to increase that a fair amount, and then I'm going to increase the scale again in our... And then I want to turn on animation speed and say just point 0.1 and see how that feels. It's not doing much. I like to go just small increments. Uh, Keep changing it until it starts to feel the way you think it should for your animation. We need a lot more subdivisions in this water. It probably doesn't need to be so wide. Let's see what I can get away with here. The the more narrow it is, the fewer subdivisions we need to have, uh, which will be better for everybody. So I'm just adjusting this until I feel like it's giving me the shapes um, without being too distorted. And how does that feel? All right, so it does feel kind of like a watery surface. I think that's working out. Uh, I think this displacer, I can turn it, tone it down a little bit in height. It doesn't have to be so crazy. Digging it. And we can even cheat a little bit by rotating this cube down so that it takes up. more of our field of view, uh, even though obviously that's not accurate, right? Uh, it's going to give us a, a, a better look, I think. Cool. Now we've got all of our animated components. And from here, it's time to set up our lighting and our materials and get ready for rendering. And so I'm going to be using Redshift to render this out. And I'm going to be using uh, a few different lights to create and an environment to create that sort of underwatery sort of feel. Uh, so the first thing I want to do is kind of set my scene up here so that I can um, see what I'm doing for lighting. I'm going to get rid of my dope sheet. So I'll just turn that off. And I'm going to set up my view panels here. I'm going to say panel, uh, new view panel. And I'm going to click and drag this one over here. Do that again, panel, new view panel. Drag this one down here. And this will be our render preview panel. So I'm just going to tighten this up so that it is uh, down to the format of our frame. And I'll say Redshift start IPR here. Uh, we want to use the Redshift camera that we made. And so you can see um, some nice things happening. I'll go ahead and get it to a section of our scene where our our character is out and out and about. 
now we can start figuring out sort of how we want to set up our materials and all that. So the first thing I want to do is I want to have a light coming in from the very top, uh, shining down from the back, right? So I want this to predominantly be backlit. And so over here on this side, I'm just going to use the default camera, make sure I don't have my lines view turned on. So we can see all of our ripples, all of our bubbles. And um, I'm going to go ahead and make a new redshift light. So we'll say area light. I'm going to move it up and back and rotate it so that it's facing towards my character. So one of the first things I want to do is create, so this is kind of like our sun, right? And so I'll go ahead and make it a little bigger and I will make some settings changes in here so that it is not a rectangle, but it's a disc. And then I want to go ahead and put a material on my water uh, and that'll help me be able to see that. And we're just going to use a glass material. So I'm going to come into my content browser or asset browser as it is now called. And I want to go to materials. Let's go ahead and make this a little bigger. And I want to go to the glass section and just find a nice transparent glass. And so these are all redshift materials and I, I want something that's, I think this glass distorted one is one I've used before that I like. So I'll drag this onto my cube. And that should immediately change the situation right now. So we've got a light in the background and the light is coming through the glass surface and it is uh, lighting up our scene in a very nice way. I think I can come into this light actually and increase the intensity to maybe 150, maybe even 200 so that it's showing through our object. I also want um, to set up an environment and in that environment, it's going to be this sort of like turquoise underwater color. And to do that, I'm going to come into my redshift objects here where we can get our sun and sky and stage and we'll sit, select redshift environment. And that is immediately going to make things super blown out and crazy. So what I want to do is come into this environment setting and just turn down my scattering to very small, like 0 0.003. Right, so that's getting us a lot closer, 0 0.002. And that'll help a lot. So I'm going to now change my color of this environment to be more of that teal sort of turquoise underwater color. And that environment fog is actually coming from this light that created we created. So if we look in our camera view here and stop looking through our camera for a moment, we'll be able to zoom out and you can see that this light is actually what's creating that fog appearance. So if we want to change the fog appearance, we need to change our light. Uh, and so what I might do is actually tone down the amount of volume being created by this light. So again, let's look through our redshift camera. We'll come into our area light. I'll call this one sun. Do a couple things. Let's change the object color so it's got a little bit more of a warm tone, like the sun. All right, so that's going to add a little bit more interest and variability to our scene. Perfect. We also want to change under details the volume here, right? So we can turn down this sun's volume and that's going to tone down the amount of sort of fog that it's adding in the background from that light. And so that's how you can control in Redshift the amount of fog generation you're getting. So this is already looking really beautiful in terms of the way the light is shining through the surface here. I'm very kind of happy with the way that looks. Let us now make a few more adjustments. I think I'm going to add a couple more lights 
it's important when you're doing lights that you save all the time because if anything's going to crash your system, it's while you're setting up your lights, most likely. Uh, so our lights are looking good. We've got a nice sort of watery background that I'm digging. Okay. Now let's put in another light in the front. So I want to have one coming in kind of from this front angle and one coming in from sort of this side angle. Uh, I'll turn off my content browser for just a little bit, readjust this. And let's make a new redshift light. I almost always just use area lights. For this one, uh, I'm going to position it so that it, it is uh, just to the front left of our object. And sometimes what I like to do is actually look through the light. So I'll say camera, use selected object as camera. And this allows you to place your light while actually looking through it, which is kind of fun. All right, so it's going to light it from this top left sort of view. Uh, but this is going to be a pretty dim light, so I'm going to move it back. And this is the light that's going to be creating the shadowy component. I do want, I'm, so I'm looking at the object over here, our character, at the same time I'm moving the light around. I don't want it to be above the water. And I'm going to give this a little bit of a different color, and I'm going to tone it down a little. So um, under object, the intensity, I'm going to turn down to like 60. So it's turned down quite a bit, maybe 50. And I'm going to say under details for volume, I'm going to turn the volume down completely. I don't want this light to generate any fog. Um, and then I'm going to give it a little bit of a color. So we'll say, I don't know, maybe a, I kind of think a little bit warm on this side. We can always adjust this as we go. I might do a little warm here, maybe a little bit more towards the greeny blues. Or reds. And then I want to duplicate this light and put it on the right side. So we'll call this uh, left light. And then I'll copy and paste that one. We'll call this one right. And then I'm going to uh, look through that camera. So use camera, selected object as camera. And this light's going to come in from the other side. Maybe more from this right angle. I just kind of want to light up these rocks and things that are in the foreground a little bit more with this light. So for this right light, I'm going to add a little bit of color. I think I'll just add a little bit more coolish, bluish purple into the scene. Just to give it a little bit of, of coolness in there. And then I think I'm going to move it around a little bit more to this side. And maybe pump the intensity of this one up to more like 70. Yeah. I think I want to add a little bit more intensity actually to this one too. And more of those. Mm, I might have to play with this color a little bit more. Some pinks perhaps. That's not bad. I'm kind of I'm kind of digging that. Okay, now I'm going to um, I'm going to add one more light in the background underneath the water to give a little reflection off the top of this, and that's going to be mostly for generating that fog color. Uh, and so let's add that one in there. I'm actually just going to take our sunlight and duplicate it. And um, over here. I want to rotate it so it's facing up and just put it down below here. So I want it kind of below the, um, 
below the horizon a little bit. That's going to add a little bit more reflection to that surface of the water, which I, I, I like. And in this one, I'm going to add some more of the deeper sort of blue green color of the ocean and come into the details section and go ahead and pump that volume back up. And actually, I think I'm going to take this color and darken it quite a bit. So it's a darker, deeper light. So it'll sort of mimic some of that deep ocean um, sort of fogginess and keep pumping up that details for the fog. So it does fill in the space a little more. Nice. Okay, so this one, I think I'll change the intensity up. It's at 200 right now. If I put it at 300, it's not making much of a difference. What if I change the scale? Yeah. So I like the way that this is uh, sort of, uh, you know, lightening up this entire region at the bottom here. Cool. So from here, I think we can work on our textures. We can change some intensities here and there. I'm gonna pump the intensity of this one up a little. All right, so we've got our sun, uh, we'll call this ocean. So this will be our deep ocean light. We've got our sunlight, we've got our left and right light. We'll sort of sandwich those together. I'm gonna to put these all in a group called lights. Maybe pump up this fogginess just a little more. Yeah. I'm liking that blue color, but I might tone it a little bit more towards, oops, a little bit more towards the greens. Ah, I see what's happening now. I think one of my redshift lights I was working on, the ocean light really wasn't taking. So this is a good lesson. Every once in a while, you want to just stop your your preview render. So let's see what happens. Okay. Yeah. Something happened with my lighting system there for a second. It just sort of glitched out, but now it's back to normal. So it's a good idea. If you see something that you didn't expect, just to kind of turn that off for a second and then turn it back on. Um, from here, I want to set up my materials. And the first thing I'm going to do is create materials for my um, rocks in the background. So let's come into our asset browser again. And uh, I think I'll just go ahead and work with some of these concrete materials. There, are, There's a nice couple of groupings of concrete down here. Um, like this is sort of a sandy color that I think will work really well. So I'm going to go ahead and grab that one, pull it into our material browser. And I'll uh, set this up so it works nice. This will be our ground and our sand. So uh, we'll call this Sand. And I do want to put this initial one on our sandy floor as a base. And then I'm going to duplicate this a few times and modify the color in here so that I can apply it to each of these individual uh, sand particles that we've created. So I'll just drag this down, control drag it, sand one. Uh, for this one, let's, so there's not a lot of information in here. One of the things that I think that's nice about using the asset browser materials is that it gives you an opportunity to learn a little bit more about how Redshift functions by looking at materials that already exist. And so I'm going to open this first one up and just take a look at how it's constructed. And this looks really complicated. There's a lot of stuff going on. But there are a couple things that we can manipulate um, 
to create more color, right? So I can come in here to this colorize group and we'll see that it's using a gradient ramp to create the color overall. And so if I just take each one of these, double click it, add a little more saturation. The first thing I'm gonna do is just add a little more saturation and lightness, okay? For each color. I'm just kind of looking at what's in there and knocking it up a little bit. So that's all already created a brighter version. Um, I also want my sand to have a little bit of uh, transparency to it. So I'm going to come into this standard material component. I'm going to come down here under transmission and just change it to like 0.5 so that it has a little bit of transparency, which you can see happening there. And then I'm going to give it a little bit of color, like maybe oranges and reds in that transparency channel. That's just going to add a little bit more brightness into that uh, transparency for that sand. So that's this one right here. Um, I think I'll add a little bit more saturation in there. Yeah, we're really starting to see some of that shine through. So nice. I'm actually going to delete this one because I like that sort of look and feel. So I'm going to duplicate this one. And maybe I'll make three or four different versions of this. So these will be our granular sands. Three, four. Uh, for this one, let's go ahead and give it more like a reddish tint and maybe make it a little bit more transparent. And let's change the color. So this, this time I'm going to make it like I'm going to make these particles a little bit more red, a little more saturated, a little brighter. So a little more red, a little more saturated, a little brighter. Good. And For sand three, let's do another color variation. Uh, let's push this more towards the yellows. Maybe make it 0.6 for transparency. Go into this little colorize menu again, and uh, maybe we'll push this one more towards the yellow saturation, a little brighter for each one of these. Great, and we'll just do one more for the sand. And I don't think, I, I'm gonna stay in this yellowy green area, so I'll just leave this one as orange, maybe a little brighter orange. Maybe I'll just pump up the saturation levels on these. Okay, so we're getting more of an orangey orangey variation. Uh, let's add some more brightness in here. So that one's got a little bit more texture in it by changing that. And I'm going to duplicate this one last time, and this is going to be our um, gem material. So we'll call this one gem. 
And this one, I'm going to uh, go ahead. I want to pump this up to red, 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 bright, bright red. I'm going to make it really transparent, like 0 0.8. 0 0.9. Uh, so it's super transparent. Um, going to turn down the reflection, I think. No, we'll leave the reflection up. And I'm going to look at the colorize channel and we're just gonna turn this entire thing into reds. So deep reds. That'll be our sparkly gem. Maybe. I'm going to come back and actually change that completely, but we'll see. Let's go ahead and get our materials on our sand particles. So I'm just going to randomly do this, like one, two, three, four, and then repeat that. So you're going to notice our scene's acting all kind of crazy. I don't know why this happens, but... If you just move one frame, it's going to go back uh, to its dynamics cached version. And so let's see how our lighting looks with this particular scenario. We might want to come in and brighten these up again. We might need to add more lighting in our scene uh, after we create our materials. I feel like they all just need to be a little bit brighter in general, lighter in color. All right. What happens if we take both of these lights and increase their intensity a little bit? I might actually need one more light here in the front that's just more of a plain sort of a foreground light. I think I'm going to do that right now. Just I want to have a little bit more interest on this area. So I'm going to take this uh, left light. And I'll call this front. And the color I'm going to make closer to white, just kind of gray, a little off white. And we're going to take this front light. I'm going to look through it. I'm going to put it. more up here in the front and we'll just tone it down to like 50 percent that's feeling a lot nicer to me uh, i just wanted to get more lighting on that front side just to even things out yeah all right so now that we've got that set up we've got our sand looking nice Let's talk about our character and put some um, texture on our character. Actually, I'm going to duplicate the same glass that I used for my water here. I'm going to drag that down. And I'm going to uh, double click this, open it up. And all I really want to do is click on the standard material section and come into reflection and increase the roughness all the way up. Right, so it's frosted glass, essentially. And so we can take that now and apply this to our um, apply this to our worm. All right, so I'll apply this directly to the cube itself that the worm's created out of.
So that's making him look very sort of gelatinous and, uh, you know, a little bit maybe too gelatinous. So I'm going to come into the uh, color area here, into the base uh, and into this uh, weight area for transmission. I'm just going to make him slightly less transparent, like 0.7. So he's still transparent, still bringing that light through like I want him to, but um, just a little bit more interesting, right? And then I want to make some color changes, right? So we, I want to add a color so I could change the base color. We could make him a red worm, right? And he's going to have this nice red glow. Um, so I'm going to think about the color choices that I want to have for the worm. Uh, and I think I want to use a ramp. So under my, in my node editor for my material, I'm going to add, I'm going to click the plus, I'm going to search for ramp. I'm going to add that ramp and then just drag that color ramp into the color for our standard material. And then right now it's going from black to white and you can see that it's darker here and whiter at the tip. And so what I want to do is, um, manipulate my ramp based on that information, right? So if I wanted to go from a dark color down here, like maybe a dark, darker red, for example, I could make it go from dark red to like, uh, A bright yellow, right? So it looks kind of gummy wormy. And depending on where this knot is, that color is going to fade closer or farther away from the end of the worm. So I'm liking the way that looks. Let's look at it from some different angles. How does it feel when it's out here a little closer? Pretty nice. Um, I'm thinking instead of red, I want to do blue, like a blue to a yellow. So let's check it out. Like pink. That's kind of cool. Okay, so that's working. And I think the one thing I want to do now is to make this even better, I think, is to add an additional inside. Like, you know, if you look at a one of these transparent critters in the ocean, they usually have sort of this, like, uh, a gut system that you can see. And so luckily, we've got this set up so that we can easily just duplicate this one. So check this out. Uh, we can take this worm, duplicate it, inside this group and then we just change its dimensions so let's see like 25 by 25. what this is going to do is create a tube within our tube i'll decrease the length by just a little bit like maybe 485 so he's just not quite as long and then um what we're going to have now is this doubling of the of the uh, tube inside of the other tube. So it'll feel more like an actual sort of critter. Let's duplicate this material. We'll call this worm gut. And what I might do here is actually just invert that gradient. And so rather than it go this way, I'm going to right click and say invert gradient. So and now it's going to be blue to pink. one way, but pink to blue the other way. All right, so if I turn off, we'll label this worm gut. If I turn this one off, it's actually doing it still the same direct. Oh, I didn't change the material. <laughs> okay, I need to put this material on my worm gut. Right, so now it's going to be opposite. So you're going to see the blue up here and the pink down here.
And for the second one, I think for the worm gut, I think I'm just going to turn down the transparency to like 0.4. So it's a little heavier inside. And that's going to even accentuate that uh, appearance more. Last but not least, we need to set up our materials for the bubbles themselves. So these bubbles need uh, a glass material. So again, I'm going to take this glass material and duplicate it. And I'll apply this to our emitter. And that'll make our bubbles look like glass right away. But actually, we want to change this glass material a little bit. So I'm going to double click on that. Uh, find the standard section of this material and come down to uh, the reflection and refraction. So the index of refraction. I'm just going to take this down so it's just like 0.95 or something like that. And I think that will make a nice reflection, refraction for the bubbles. So it feels more like something that's underwater. And there we have it. Uh, so our materials are all set up. Our um, scene is all set up. Uh, I might m mess around with these materials one more time just to get some refinement. And I won't make you watch me struggle through that. Uh, but uh, I think just getting those colors the way we want them is, is really important. Okay, so I've got some. I've got my materials set up the way I like them, and uh, now it's time to set up the materials for the gems. Uh, get our focus set up for our camera, and then set things up to render. So let's go ahead and put our gem materials on there, and these are in our gems folder. We can just drag this texture right on the gems folder. Now these uh, guys will be a lot brighter. Let's brighten them up even more. Let's pump these colors all up significantly and let's turn that transmission weight up to all the way to the top and we just want to double uh, check some things and set up our shallow depth of field I'd like to have like super shallow depth of field on this and I'm going to focus actually, I think, on these gems area. And so to do that, I want to create a null object. So null, and this is going to be our focus. And I'm going to grab this null and move it so that it is aligned with those gems. And I'll just use my free area right here. And then in my camera, I'm going to tell uh, under the optical section, I'm going to tell it to use the focus as my focus uh, depth. And then I'm going to tell my camera under the optical to use bokeh. And then I'm going to turn the aperture setting down to one for starters and see how that looks. And this is where we have to do some testing around because uh, getting that aperture setting right is imperative to getting the look that you're trying to get. So I'm digging the way the light's coming through now. Uh, and I like the way things are feeling. I want a little bit more depth of field in there. So I'm going to come into my camera and just try like 0.5 and see if that might be working for me. Let that do its preview. And I'll do a couple of uh, test segments here. So let's try like 
180 frames in. Try 360, 460. Cool. That's all looking really nice. The final thing I want to set up is the shadow that comes in and spooks our character. And to do that, I'm just going to use uh, a simple disk and doesn't need to have a material on it or anything like that. It's just going to come in and it's going to block our light. So I'm going to turn off our IPR for a little bit. I'm going to turn off our asset browser, turn off our material browser, give myself some room, save my file. I'm going to create a disk. It'll be a Z plus disk, and I'm going to place that right in front of my left light. Just want to make sure it's not in front of my camera at all. It's actually behind my camera, which is great. And what I'm going to do is just animate this up so it goes from here to here. And we'll see what that looks like here. So here's with the shadow and without the shadow. And so let's look at the dope sheet. We've got our character. Um, leaving right here so we're going down so we want the shadow to come up right before he leaves but not like we want it to come up and then there needs to be like a couple of seconds or so for uh, just waiting for him to not even a couple seconds a split second before he actually responds and so let's have maybe as he's curling up some shadows coming into place Right, so maybe the starting point of the shadow is happening right there. And then as we get closer here, it's in full shadow. In front of some of our lights. So scooping up, shadow comes into view. Spooks, they go away. I feel like it needs a little less time, so maybe the shadow starts a little later. Like as soon as the scooping happens, it begins to come up. Yeah. Okay, hide the dope sheet. We'll look at our preview render one last time. So this is before the shadow. This is full shadow. And then it goes away. Render settings. For the render settings, we're going to say Redshift. We're going to output 1920 by 1080. Um, 
Uh, we're going to do 30 frames per second. We're going to output our a manual frame range from 100 to 650, 550. We don't want that first 100 frames, right, as you'll recall. And then we want to save this out as JPEG uh, sequence. Let's give it a place to live. We'll say new folder rendered frames. We'll call this I've been calling it a tentacle for a while, so, but I think it's a worm. We're going to call it a worm in sand. Save. Um, we don't need multi-pass. And that is it. So I'll let this render out and then uh, show you the final version. So I hope you found this video tutorial helpful. And uh, if you'd like to see more, please go ahead and like and subscribe and uh, I'll see you in another video.